Okay, um, members, um, the, the meeting is now open to the public and um, welcome to the, the 20th meeting of the Economy Committee. Some members will be joining us by Yes, um, I think we have Sinead McLaughlin and John Stewart. John Stewart has hopefully come in later. Christopher Stolford has offered apologies. He has uh, chamber duties and won't be able to attend, so okay. we put him down for apologies. Oh, okay, so... Um, our witnesses from the Further Education Colleges will also be briefed us via teleconference. The meeting will be broadcast live and a recording will be made available on the committee's web pages on the Assembly website. Um, members can mute their tablets by pressing F4 on their device. Um, first item on the agenda is apologies. We have apologies from Stuart Dixon as he is um, still off due to illness. Uh, we have also apologies Christopher from Christopher um, and we're expecting everybody else yeah. at some point. Um, so our oral briefing this morning from the, the regional college principals is our only item of business. There are papers from page five on, in your packs. Um, so the item number two then is our briefing. Um, there is a clerk's memo at page five. There is a copy of the presentation from the Further Education Colleges at page seven. There is correspondence from the College Principals Group at page 13 and a briefing paper from the Further Education Colleges at page 3 of your table papers. Um, and members <coughs> will have received that yesterday afternoon. Yes. I think, Chair, the, the briefing is based on the slides. So if members want to go to the slides, which went out in the pack, the first pack yesterday. Okay, so I'd like to welcome to our meeting this morning Michael McAllister, who is Principal and Chief Executive of South West Regional College, Leo Murphy, who is Principal and Chief Executive of North West Regional College, and Louise Ward-Hunter, who is Principal and Chief Executive of Belfast Metropolitan College. Welcome to our meeting, everyone, and if you want to go through the, um, your briefing first of all, and then we'll open it up to members for questions. Thank you very much indeed, Chair, and it's, um, it, well, it's not too hard to figure out, it's Louise here. I'll, I'll be leading out on the briefing and then look forward to your questions afterwards. So we, we really welcome the chance to speak to uh, the Economy Committee today. Presentation is only half a dozen slides. We want to set out for you the range, breadth and depth of what we do as FE Colleges to set out our dual role in promoting economic growth and social inclusion and then to tell you a little bit more about our response to COVID-19 and what that involves in terms of supporting current and future learners and employers. And before I go any further, may I just check with you that you can hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Okay, I'll continue. A little bit by way of background, you'll know that we're NDPBs uh, of um, Department for the Economy as our, as our sponsor department, of course, and we deliver clearly on the goals and ambitions for a wide range of government policy, including the program, draft program for government and FE means success, amongst others. While we are individual colleges of six, we have our own individual identities. We serve different geographic regions and learners, but we absolutely have a shared vision mission and shared values. The sector itself generates both wealth and jobs and an independent report five years ago said that we generated 524 million of output and over 7,000 full-time equivalent jobs. So while we are indeed a big group of public institutions, we are not just educational establishments, we're local employers and we're partner organisations in local communities. And in 1819, I can give you a few brief stats we generated 52 million of goods and services. We uh, employed together uh, 3,350 people. We put 126 million into the economy, and we had over 9,000 partnerships with employers and community organisations. And we've had significant investment in our college campuses recently, and that's in recent years. And that's very much been about improving facilities for learners in local communities and businesses right the way across Northern Ireland. We are also demand-led, and we have to compete for learners with both schools and universities, both locally here in Northern Ireland and UK-wide. Now, just over a third, 33.5% of school leader leavers come to FE colleges, but we recognise that the majority go on to higher education, and that's 43%. And that's something I'll come back to in the presentation. Our sector is crucial in supporting those young people who leave school with little or no qualifications, and that's about giving them the essential and employability skills. And as you know, just under 30% of school leavers leave without the required five GSEs. 
at A Star to see in English and in Maz. We're vitally employer faced and employer driven, responding to the needs of different sizes of employers right the way across the sector. So there's a there's a big issue for not for us now about how do we respond to that. So if I turn you to the next slide, that sets out our core business and numbers. You can see there that we have over 61,000 students studying at the six colleges. Most of our learners are young, they're under 25. Our curriculum spans helping those who need essential skills, as I just mentioned, but right the way through to full degrees. And as a new ent uh, entrant in the FE sector over just seven weeks ago, I am amazed at the diversity of learning that we provide and the range of learners we have. Our learners study at all levels, most are at level two, that's GCSE equivalent, and we've got level three learners, and that's A-level equivalent, and 9% of our provision is in higher education, and that's at level four and above. I talked a little bit, therefore, about the range and diversity of learners. We are inclusive institutions, and our role and scale, I think, sometimes isn't fully understood. So, for example, 43% of our enrolments come from the least well-off income quintiles, and, and that's really, really significant in terms of our contribution uh, in, in not just to the economy, but to an inclusive Northern Ireland. We deliver targeted programmes aimed at long-term unemployed and those aged 16 to 24 who weren't in education, employment or training. We also support refugees and asylum seekers. And very importantly, we run programmes providing to, on average, about 500 prisoners each day prisons in Northern Ireland. And we are a key delivery partner for apprenticeships and new traineeships programmes. And those are going to be introduced from September 21. So I'd like to tell you a little bit, if you want to turn to your next slide, about how we are going about supporting our students at this very important time. The labour market is qualifications hungry. So equipping people with the skills to compete in the labour market with high quality, valued and indeed work ready qualifications is key. Very many of the jobs which are keeping our economy afloat right now are vocational, whether that's plumbing and joinery, whether it's IT, manufacturing, or as we have seen in this pandemic, health and social care work. For our current learners, having their learning recognised for this year is paramount. The majority of learners taking general vocational or technical qualifications, VTQs as we call them, will be issued with calculated grades, as with GCSEs and A-levels, but there will need to be adaptive assessments in place for many others, and I think we would like to come back to that uh, to committee. Some learners require an assessment to achieve a licence to practice, that might be an electrician or a plumber, and calculated grades for those people will not be acceptable. So you can see one size does not fit all. Colleges need peer guidance regarding these assessments from awarding organisations. Three out of our four students have been engaged in remote learning during lockdown, and we've developed guiding principles to set the direction for our future delivery in line with health guidance and social distancing. Our aim is obviously is to maximise where we can face-to-face -face learning, but we must recognise the importance now of remote learning too. An investment is needed to tackle digital poverty. This is a much bigger societal and policy issue. Our colleges are contributing to addressing its vision of laptops and creating where we are in, in college, dedicated areas within college so our students can access IT. Turning you to the next slide, let's look at our plans for September. So a few key points there. Uh, as usual, SE colleges set out our future provision and targets in our annual college development plans, and that's within the budget that is allocated to us by the Department for the Economy. These, this year, these plans will set out how we're going to do so under the uncertainty caused by COVID-19. So you can imagine they are going to be slightly different in appearance. We are now trying to figure out, as college leaders, how teachers teach, how our classrooms are configured to maintain social distancing, how much learning is done online versus face-to-face. -face. And we're trying to find creative solutions while very importantly maintaining our standards. And that's critical to give confidence to learners and to our staff alike. All of our colleges are open for applications from September for September 2020, but we can tell the committee that applications are down on last year by up to 40% in some cases. There's thousands of employers with whom we already work or could work. However, we expect that fewer will sign up to programmes with us. And across the six colleges in Northern Ireland, demand from employers to recruit apprentices is estimated to fall by more than 50%. And these are big, big figures, as you can tell. 
<clears throat> our online provision, mentoring and bespoke offerings are going to be essential to meet the needs of businesses, uh, learners in employment and those returning to employment to help revive our economy. And that brings me to my next slide, which is all about supporting our economic recovery. We, as I said before, are lead providers of vocational and training qualifications, and they're essential to address the skills needs of the Northern Ireland economy right now. There was research done by an organisation called UUEPC, and that shows that the labour market in the next 10 years is going to demand more people with skills at all levels, but mostly at level three and above. There is currently an undersupply at level three to five, that's A levels and their equivalent, foundation degrees, HNDs and HNCs, and FE colleges equip people with the skills at these levels. Now, we know it could very well be said that getting a degree attracts greater public interest, perhaps even greater policy interest, but you can tell that if the gaps ahead are in, the, are, are in, in um, levels three to five, then clearly that's where we must continue to orient our efforts. Promoting apprenticeships and new HLAs is going to be key, but this presents new challenges because the demand for these places is driven by employers. And since March of this year, 2,338 apprentices have been furloughed and 191 have been made redundant. So you can see the impact on apprenticeships right away. We're going to see challenges ahead in terms of COVID-19 and Brexit. That's going to clearly place pressures on employers and labour market opportunities. And again, back to that UU EPC report, the local economy uh, is speculated that it could contract by almost 13% in 2020, with two, nearly 250,000 workers based in furlough or temporarily laid off. So we see ourselves absolutely as part of the economic drive for recovery, and we're vital in doing that. So my final slide looks to the future. Investment is needed to cover a number of key areas, to build our college's digital infrastructure, to help train and indeed reward our teachers to adapt to and deliver blended learning, and to accelerate the provision of fit-for-purpose infrastructure that meets the new standards which will be expected for public health, and by that mm -hmm. I mean social distancing. The FE sector already faced a number of challenges. Principally, that was around, and I flagged it up earlier on, that was about competing for learners between post-primary schools for year 13 and 14 pupils who may very well be suited better to vocational and technical courses rather than A-levels, and of course, competing with universities. But the challenges have assumed greater significance against the backdrop of COVID-19. I talked a little bit about the investment in IT infrastructure. We must be very clear that we don't compound inequality through digital poverty, and that is something to which all six colleges are alert. We also need to, th to think about how do we hold the awarding organisations to account. And of course, we are reflecting on the importance of our FE teacher salaries and our ability to attract, to reward, and to retain staff. Looking in a very positive way, we believe that there are real opportunities for the sector too. We want to build those programs so that learners can complete remotely. We want to expand provision and choice for learners who want to stay local. And I, I think many of us are seeing the importance of that right now. Uh, and, and not least, we are, we are alive to the, the knock-on uh, impact of decisions taken across the water on a cap on learners going uh, to uh, UK inst GB institutions. We're looking at higher education level. We are, of course, continuing our co close relationship with employers, and that's about how do we develop the tailored support to support our employers who are going to take the, the employees of the future. And we want to be able to target support at the most vulnerable learners or those furthest from the labour market, and that really goes back to this social, uh, this social inclusion and economic uh, recovery uh, dual mandate that we have that we contribute to both. So in conclusion, and thank you for your time, Chair and Committee members, in conclusion and speaking on behalf of the FE sector in these introductory comments, what I can say confidently is that with the right recognition, investment and support, we will be able to fulfil our social and economic commitments 
on the needs of Northern Ireland PLC and society, and certainly to give full effect to the ambitions which we know our Minister has in terms of supporting mm. recovery of Northern Ireland from this very, very difficult chapter. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. That's the end of my opening comments. Thank you very much, um, Louise. And first of all, I'd like to put on record um, our appreciation um, to you as colleges and all that you have done um, over the course of this crisis. We've all seen how colleges have, have stepped up um, in terms of you know, diversifying to provide PPE and, and other things in, um, in, in, in collaboration with businesses as well. Um, and there's you know, very much a recognition of that. Um, I, you're, you, you know, you're, you're speaking to the converted here when, when you talk about the importance of, of the sector, um, and I hope that that is recognised by, by you as, as principals that, that we do recognise how important um, the colleges are to the broader um, economy and society here. Um, there obviously are longer term issues that w that we do need to discuss in detail, um, but I'd like to pick up. First of all, on some of the more immediate issues facing you as principals and obviously your learners as well, um, in relation to the, I suppose, the immediate crisis around COVID, the awarding of um, those qualifications that you have highlighted there, where there are um, need to provide greater guidance around that in terms of those things like licences to practice or whether or do you need to be practical assessments and what um, um, advice and guidance that you, that you are getting from the department around that and also around from the awarding bodies what sort of um, communication because I, I understand from talking to some of you that this, you know many of these qualifications are, are provided by um, awarding bodies in England and um, who have a different term timetable to ourselves here in the north and their, their term runs to the end of July and ours is the end of June um, and you know well, how is that working or how, how do you envisage that is going to work in the next week or two? Um, sorry I was just going to say it has been patchy depending on awarding organisations but I wanted to pass over to Michael and, and Leo to perhaps comment on that. Yeah. Chair uh, Michael McAllister, South West College. Uh, I suppose, first of all, again, uh, members and Chair, thank you very much for the invite to be here, um, and we appreciate your support. Yes, uh, I suppose when we reflect on where we currently are and where we would like to be, uh, there's still quite a bit of work to be done. Um, we have been working very closely uh, with the awarding organisations, trying to create the right environment to make sure that um, as many students as possible achieve their qualifications, but I think it's fair to say that there is a potential for a large number of students not to get their full award uh, this summer, students who would normally be finishing, and that's a major concern for us. And I suppose there, there are a number of factors, you've heard some of them already from Louise. Um, we have a very different timeline in Northern Ireland than, than exists in the rest of uh, the UK. Uh, our academic year, our school year, finishes uh, a bit earlier, and most of the awarding organisations that we currently work with are um, English-based, and that, that presents a major challenge because the lion's share of their market is in England and Wales, and uh, we're quite small in relation to them, but that doesn't help our learners. So, you know, we have been trying, uh, working in partnership with the Department of the Economy, to raise awareness around this and we're trying to make all of the awarding organizations understand that um, if the guidance is not forthcoming is not comprehensive and is not timely then there is a significant risk that a number of students potentially a significant number of students into the hundreds will not achieve their qualification at the end of this academic year and that's a major concern and i suppose the implications of that uh, for us going forward is that um, a number of those students then may be delayed and have to come back in the new academic year. And again, if we're going into a scenario where um, we have socially distanced uh, classrooms, workshops, labs, etc., then space will be at a premium. And if we want to bring in a new cohort, but that space is still being occupied by students who should now be finished, then uh, I don't need to explain the, the issues there. Uh, logistically, that will become very challenging. 
and potentially that will impact the pipeline into the economy of, of skilled provision. So we want to avoid that at all costs. Some of the award organisations have been very uh, proactive. Some of them have been a bit slow. Uh, we won't necessarily name a chain, but that, that is an ongoing conversation and, and a major concern. Yeah, uh, and, and to pick up as well, Chair, just to, to confirm that, we're welcome that the Department has established an advisory and oversight group to give us a road of direction. But I suppose sometimes in the media, the discussion is quite linear about schools and about universities. And work-based learning is quite unique. Young people and adults undertake work-based learning courses, have to do elements of practical work-based assessment or simulated assessment to get their license to practice. An electrician must complete practical elements under assessment to complete their qualification. So there's uniqueness about the qualification landscape. Uh, sometimes it's missed in the broader media sense in Northern Ireland in terms of further education. And as Michael said, we're attempting to, along with the department, develop a roadmap that we can provide a pathway for these young people and adults to get the completion of their, their qualification. There's a phrase we've used across the six colleges is to avoid almost the bed blocking taking place to make sure we can get our new entrants in and get our existing trainees and apprentices completed uh, and, and hopefully into some type of employment. And, and may I just add very briefly that, that the colleges uh, have had to engage in some cases with the awarding organisations um, you know, directly and trying to talk to them. And for us, I think the issue is one of um, pace, uh, chair and committee members. We, you, the, what we are clear about is the impact and import of moving as swiftly as we possibly can to arrive at the solutions for these learners uh, and that has been well set out by uh, my two colleagues. And also Chair, I would add that there is also an industrial landscape is changing. If I take a sector like early years, many of those particular work-based learning experiences would have to take place in a childcare setting, either in a primary school or in a creche. And for example, we don't know how receptive those particular sectors will be to receive work-based assessment um, you know, when, when they get into the autumn. So that adds a further challenge that the actual industrial landscape of when we pick up that work-based assessment is in, in, is in a fluid state, might be the best way to describe it. Yeah. Chair, if you wouldn't mind if, if I came back in again just to, uh, I suppose, broaden out uh, the conversation a wee bit here. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of uh, young people at the level two and level three space, and that's that's been a major focus for us. But we also have, uh, through a tremendous program called the Higher Level Apprenticeship, we have uh, young people and adults at a higher level who are also impacted significantly here. And if you think for a moment, higher level apprentices are well, they have employed status, uh, and that that means that they're currently working with employers, but a number of them quite a significant number of them have been furloughed and that has implications in relation to the achievement of their core qualification. For many of them that will be a foundation degree and um, I suppose a core component of, of, of their program is to complete a work-based learning module and if they're not in employment um, the awarding body for example uh, and again we won't name and shame uh, but the awarding bodies, for example, are looking at this and considering whether or not they can award a work-based learning module. Our contention would be that we must be very careful to ensure that there is no detriment to any student and effective and real mitigations should be put in place. And I suppose, again, just to give you the potential outcome here, Students that should be finishing this summer with their higher level apprenticeship and their foundation degree potentially will not, and that will impact their progression opportunities. And, you know, some of them may wish to progress to local universities. Some of them may wish to develop their career and stay in work. But also, some of those students may have planned to move on to other universities. And if they're not able to achieve their foundation degree and not able to achieve their work-based learning module because they're currently furloughed, then that will have serious implications for them. So there are impacts right across the levels, level two, level three, and up until level four and level five also. 
I'll just come back in there and pick up on a couple of the points. In relation to, um, you mentioned the, the conversations ongoing with the warden body and the importance of timely guidance. Do you feel that there is a recognition of an um, understanding of that from the awarding bodies, in, in particular those that are England-based? And then just on that point, um, Michael, around the, the HLAs, um, ha has that developed any since um, you have previously contacted myself around that? Um, and we have that um, communication for, for the committee that we're passing on to the department as well. But has there been any further um, developments around that? Well, I suppose, Chair, in relation to the higher level apprenticeships, we, we have proposed several uh, potential ways through this, but I suppose thus far uh, that has not been progressed, and it's outside of our control. Uh, I mean, if the colleges as a collective were a significant awarding organisation in our own right, uh, you know, we could take that forward. But, you know, we've been working with partners, and uh, we've had lots of success and, and good relationships with them in the past, but there is a particular blockage at the moment, and that, to answer your question, that has not progressed since since uh, we last spoke about it. In terms of, uh, I suppose, the awarding organisations that are, are, many of them are based in England, I think in Northern Ireland we work with, in the uh, professional and technical arena, we work with just over 80 awarding organisations, which is very, very significant. And I think long term, we need to plan for having uh, a much more streamlined approach and uh, again potentially have you know one central awarding organization that can deal with all of this and then we will have I suppose a lot more um, uh, timely interventions when situations like this arise in the future hopefully not hopefully it doesn't arise very often but uh, who knows what's ahead of us so so we have a lot of awarding organizations they are focused on the English and the Welsh market because that's where the lion's share of their business is and they have been slow to come forward with solutions. And just finally for myself, before I hand over to other members, um, in relation to apprentices, and in particular those who um, started last year, um, how has the um, conversation, I suppose, with the departments gone around um, the fixes that might be put in place to support those? Because I know from talking to different training providers and also industry partners that there, there is real concern around, and you give some numbers there um, in your presentation, Louise, about the numbers that have been furloughed and made redundant, and that, that's really, really concerning. Um, you know, and in particular, um, so, you know, some of the, the learners that, that you will have that um, you know, have not had a great school experience and that... Um, that we really want to keep in um, education. So how has that kind of um, developed in, in collaboration with the department and others? I can pick that up, Chair. I think that, I mean, we are working in partnership with the department. They're, they're well aware of the challenges. We would have a weekly meeting with the Director of Further Education uh, and people associated in the skills branch. I suppose individually, in colleges, we're kind of monitoring the furlough journey. I know in my own college, we've gone from about 84% down to about 73%. We're also watching what sectors are beginning to kick off again uh, to, to find a full picture. It might be uniform. Um, it's also impacted by, I'd say, some of our apprentices. It depends on the sector uh, and depends if they're taken back into the system. I mean, but yes, I mean, we will be looking to work through under the policy guidance from the department solutions around this. We're aware of it. And I think we we want to do things that are strategic and directional for our young people to maintain our apprentices internationally. The general guidance is that apprentices are, are going to be crucial to the rebuilding of the economy. So we are alert to the fact that um, working closely with our own parent department as to how we best try to maintain that. But it is challenging. It's challenging for a lot of the small micro businesses that would have taken apprentices on in manufacturing, perhaps they were depending on a shop refurbishment. Those shop refurbishments may not take place as individual businesses as they kick back, take a look at their own economic situation. And, and you're always concerned that the apprentice becomes the casualty at the end of this and maybe a culture where the apprentice is put on the long finger. But we're, we're very we're very alert to the fact, we're very alert to the data and, and you know, hopefully working with our own uh, parent department, we're going to try to find solutions to keep apprentices in work. Yeah. And uh, Chair, Chair if, I, if I could make a short point there, sorry, Michael Southwest. Um, I mean, I, I've been approached over the past um, seven days by 
a number of engineering employers in, in the Minoster area. And again, a lot of them have, uh, have a reach out to other parts of Northern Ireland. But, you know, I, I think it'd be fair to say they're very anxious about the future. They, they, they are keen to get going. Uh, there's a lot of uh, activity started to pick up again in the engineering industry, but they absolutely want access to apprentices, but they also want access to support around that. And, and uh, I think the, the furloughing scheme has been very helpful to a lot of industries, and in particular that industry uh, in recent times. So I think we need to be very careful about any, any changes that we make in relation to support for employers, because at the end of the day, if the employers are not there, our apprentices are not needed, and you know what are we training people for? So employers are core to this. And just to endorse what Leo has said, about uh, you know the oversight and advisory group which has been set up by the minister and the, and the department, you know we have high hopes for that. We hope to get a lot of uh, coherence and, and good guidance coming forward from that. And I believe their first meeting is uh, is this afternoon. So so look, we're working in partnership with the department and the minister, and we're hoping to uh, I suppose uh, map a clear route through the, the, this this current difficulty. Thank you for me, um, Sinead. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael, uh, Leo and Louise. Uh, very good briefing. Um, obviously, it's a very challenging time, but I believe that the FE colleges are going to be our front line in recovery, uh, and they will need all the economic uh, uh, support that they can to get through this. But just back to the apprenticeship, I mean, I, I, I am concerned that the apprenticeship application process, you're saying that they're 50% down for uh, for um, for recruitment, uh, and that is, is concerning because I do believe that our, the apprenticeship program will be vitally important, particularly for our young people who are facing into the abyss of now major um, unemployment figures. But uh, there last month, Boris Johnson uh, promised a guaranteed apprenticeship for young people, uh, and he was very much talking about an interventionist approach, possibly along the line that, that Michael was saying, you know, a support not just for the apprenticeships, but also for the employers. Um, trade unions last month also said that the, the, the new jobs guarantee would should provide at least a minimum of six months training uh, with accredited training for young people. Um, do you see that the, a, a new apprenticeship program based on dual support for the apprenticeship and for the employers to take on those apprenticeships um, is something that um, would actually maybe be able to get those numbers up uh, and address the, 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 the lack of applications or the enrolments? Uh, in that area, and I suppose I mean that uh, I, I'll give that uh, to Leo there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Sinead. <laughs> I, I think there's obviously a time to refresh policy in, in changing circumstances, and we're in a completely changing landscape. Maybe where the existing models around the apprenticeship may need to be flexed, and I think that's a piece we'll all be hoping, uh, you know, in consultation with the department to take a look at. I think Sinead very much we we've all the memories of short-term interventions from the 1980s mm -hmm. and i wouldn't like us to lose the gold standard of apprenticeships replace it with classroom based uh softer alternatives and, and people maybe perhaps drifting into very focused curriculum and, and not the sectors that they should be in yes so i think we need a deep dive and take a look at the apprenticeship model moving forward due to the change in circumstances and whatever interventions can be made to support that. I think we're also conscious there's a lot of pressure on the public purse and there's a lot of pressure on budgets and we're not alone as the only people coming to the table. But I think if we look, um, recently we had some uh, linkages with this little piece of work we we're doing uh, and they're investing heavily on the way forward for apprentices because they see it as absolutely crucial. And I think globally, I think you'll find a lot of economies will make that necessary investment, uh, almost like an invest the same model around apprenticeships moving forward because mm -hmm. what they will feel is we need to build an economy and build a way out of this and we don't want the generational gap where young people, as I say, don't find an opportunity to get into meaningful and, and work centered apprenticeship rather than, than, than creation of semi visit classroom based activities, if that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. And just one further question. This to Louise. Louise, you mentioned about further education colleges in Northern Ireland have two distinct different roles 
the social inclusion uh, and driving economic development. Um, I suppose one is addressing kind of some of the weaknesses of the post primary school system uh, with far too many leavers coming or leavers from school leavers coming out with uh, very little uh, basic skills. Uh, and then the second is to provide that high level vocational training that's really focused on, on delivering for the economy. Uh, those are very separate challenges. Is that not difficult to do? And, and, and what do you think of uh, the Republic of Ireland? Um, policy in relation to driving technical colleges uh, at that higher level in order to, do, to, to, to deliver for the economy. Um, in responding to that, um, Sinead, I, will, I, I will, will have to confess that my relative newness to the sector um, means that I'm not yet fully familiar with uh, perhaps what is happening um, down, down south, so I will take that away and have a look at it, um, still familiarising my, myself with the sector. But in response to the first question, which is how do, you, how do we as a college uh, and as colleges um, deliver on that dual mandate, I think there's an aspect for me, which as a, a former policymaker, as a former civil servant, I, I absolutely recognise the, the wider policy environment, educational and skills environment and that backdrop that we're, that we're working within. And, and how, um, how, how, that, uh, how, the, how vital it is that all, that all coheres. Um, the, I, I cited in, my, um, in the presentation the issue of the high percentage of young people who are leaving school at, at 16 uh, without those essential qualifications and therefore what FE colleges need to do in, in, picking, in picking them up. Now, that, as we know, I've been working back in Northern Ireland since the early 90s. That it was a, a, a endemic then, and it remains remains so now. So I, I know that this the only way to solve it is through much wider collaboration of all invested parties, not simply FE colleges. But the bit that I can see from where I have joined over um, the last lot of weeks is the is the um, valuing, and this is the bit that I will go to, is the valuing of every learner who crosses our threshold whether they are a young learner coming in to do, to do the most basic essential skills or whether they are a young person uh, who is um, go, go on their way, on that pathway to higher education, or indeed um, somebody, an adult or a more mature person coming in who is either reskilling or upskilling. And I know that we're going to see an awful lot more from that, and I'm really looking forward to see what the, um, the, 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 the policy direction for DFE will be on that whole skills recovery piece. So I think I would, I would conclude by saying the issue for me in terms of trying to reconcile the economic responsiveness that we must do as colleges and our commitment to social inclusion is at the heart, I think, of the widest perspective that our Northern Ireland executive has, has which is economic and social are two sides of the one coin we are a microcosm in reflecting that at college at college level thank you Sinead. thanks Sinead. chair if i could come in uh, just to add a, a little bit to that um look, look I, I think we have to uh, be willing to to look at uh, and learn from best practice wherever we see it and, and i know you know i mean i've been in the sector for 33 years and in that time, colleges have been willing and prepared to go and look at other jurisdictions. We, we, we've travelled to, you know, to North America. We've, we've looked at uh, systems in Germany, uh, and in recent years, we've looked at things that are happening in Spain and in, in, in uh, the Basque region. So there's a lot of excellent activity, and in particular, I suppose at the moment in in, uh, in the south, there's a lot of uh, activity around the development of technical universities. There's also a lot of realignment taking place in the education and training boards. And equally, uh, a lot, lot of those bodies like to know what is happening here in Northern Ireland. And we've had people from, in the past year, we've had groups from Kerry, Dublin, Wexford, right across uh, a broad range of counties. And that's the same for every college in Northern Ireland. So, you know, I think we learn from each other, and I think we shouldn't be afraid of that. Uh, but one point I would make, maybe uh, just kind of linking back to the previous comments about apprenticeships, there are three key legs in the stool. I mean, the department's there from a policy perspective, 
the employers that are there absolutely to provide those placements and job opportunities. But the colleges have huge expertise and we all have our strengths. So we all must work together. And I think we need to be careful about any policy changes we make going forward in relation to the structure and the type and the, and the way that, for example, apprenticeships are, are, are laid out. Uh, things are working reasonably well, I would say very well. And I think we need to add to that and, and not make any um, seismic changes at this moment in time. And I suppose lastly, just to say that, uh, you know, in recent years, we've had a development in partnership with the Department of Curriculum Hubs. And each of the college, each of the colleges are curriculum hubs for specific industries. And they have that responsibility across Northern Ireland to lead the development of those qualifications. But that, importantly, that is done in partnership with industry. And that means that, you know, we, we hear the employer's voice, we make sure that uh, our qualifications are fit for purpose, and we're planning for the future in partnership with industry. And I think we need to build on that and, uh, and uh, consolidate that. Um, Gordon. Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much, everyone, Louise, Leo, and Michael, for your presentation. It's very clear. Most of the issues have been covered. Um, we certainly are very much aware of the great work that's done by colleges. There's, there has been considerable investment in buildings, and I think it's great for Northern Ireland that that has happened. And, uh, but without people like yourselves, uh, it, it's, this whole system wouldn't work. So what you've done or are doing for young people is, is to be commended, and we certainly appreciate what you've done. And I, Coming from North Down, we're in regular contact with Ken Webb. I'm sure you all know Ken, a man of few words. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, with the Cert Colleges, he certainly has done a great job, and we certainly appreciate what, what all of you have done, and we wish you all the best. In relation to preparing your premises to both to be COVID-19 compliant, uh, is there an issue there about funding and investment in, in those preparations? Obviously, they're important, and the way things are moving and have moved in the last week, perhaps you need to be seen to be moving promptly on those issues and um, my final issue is just you talked about enrolment at this stage being down about 40 percent do you think that all been well and if things pick up you will we'll be able to address that issue and boost the enrollment figures back up to where you would expect you, back to normal yeah. okay. uh, want to take the covid and i'll take the recruitment piece if you want yeah yeah uh, ab absolutely um, well, look, I, I suppose, as we've referred to earlier, um, th th there's quite a heavy piece of work to be done by the oversight and advisory group, and there will be recommendations coming from that. And I would imagine, following the recommendations, there will be some funding pressures that will have to be, uh, have to be looked at. I mean, if, if we're going to introduce new um, systems within colleges that will involve uh, potentially some minor works or capital expenditure, that will bring costs, certainly in terms of uh, PPE. You know, whilst the colleges have, uh, have surrendered most of their PPE in, in the current crisis to those that absolutely needed it, and we've also been involved in developing and manufacturing visors and things like that, we now know that as we're heading into this new arena, there will be PPE costs. And, you know, we've done a lot of analysis in each college, but that will come together under the Oversight and Advisory Group. So, yes. Uh, uh, there's work to be done, we can do it, and, and I imagine there will be a cost implication. And, and just before we leave that subject, if I may jump in before Leo, I mean, the obvious thing is that we won't be able to have all of our learners on site um, even when we do come back because of social distancing, and, and therefore we are going to have lower numbers physically in the in, in the room. So that is a that is a permutation, Gordon, which we which we are actively working through. And as Leo referred, there is a, a particular uh, guidance and advisory group which is taking place this afternoon, and our our colleague. Uh, and fellow principal Brian Doran is representing all of the principals on that to raise some of these issues this afternoon. Uh, and just to, before I go into the exam space, Gordon, um, the recruitment is on top of that. Most of the colleges are now in the process of establishing their own, I suppose, local site operational implementation group because, it, you know, we, we may get strategic advice and guidance, but every building is different. They all have different age profiles. The different levels of risk assessments have to take place due to local circumstances. So we're, 
we're taking the strategic guidance that will come from the group and then we're operationalizing it within our own particular colleges. Your question around, I suppose, where recruitment sits at the moment, it's a bit of crystal ball gazing. Um, we're, we're, you've obviously had the readout on apprentices to see what way that might land, I suppose. The higher education is under pressure, and uh, there's no doubt the, the kind of um, almost potential un uncontrolled growth around unconditional offers across the water. I am very much a strong advocate of young people staying in Northern Ireland, progressing in Northern Ireland, and adding to the economy where possible. So we're losing a third of our young people through that particular hemorrhaging across the water uh, to GB universities, and then we reckon a third of them don't come back. So. That, uh, you know, trying to get, um, I suppose, a sophisticated discussion around schools and gatekeepers about the need for level four and level five qualifications at work and balancing that with an immediate unconditional offer from a GB university for the degree um, can cause difficulty. So we'll be watching how that matches out. The other piece for us is, I suppose, it'll be slightly different around exam time. So if examinations results come out for GCSE and A levels and the adopted um, grades come out for our BTEC programs, I think there'll be um, individual and family debates about young people. Do they stay at school? Do they come to college? And, and that's going to work out through the system. So what we've all been involved in, I suppose, is lifting everything possibly into a virtual platform. I know we just completed in the Northwest a virtual higher education week. Other colleges um, are at this um, regularly, but I mean, certainly the capacity in the old world where we would have a strong face-to-face -face counselling exercise would have helped us obviously work hard on recruitment. At the moment, we're doing all that at distance, so we're, we're concerned to watch the outworkings of that. In fact, in my own college, the recruitment team were looking last week and trying to follow through. Ironically, the number of students who'd started the online application process and had stopped it when COVID happened. So we're going to try to pick up the pieces and kind of dialogue with them. Uh, um, and also, we don't know what our part-time market will look like uh, next year. Some of that is delivered on site. Some is delivered in third-party providers in the community. So we have to see how that's going to shape up and if people have an appetite to come back to learning either online, blended, or face-to-face -face, uh, uh, situation. So it is really, in my almost 30 years of FE, it's gone into probably the most challenging assessment of, of what recruitment might land. Grant, thanks very much. And we always, I think, are impressed with your ability and determination to work with industry and business. So we wish you well as business gets back uh, to normal. We wish you well in adapting to all of that and uh, keep up the good work. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, and, and thank you all for your presentation this morning. Um, just to echo the Chair's comments, I uh, want to put on record uh, our thanks to you uh, and to the students and to the staff for adapting uh, so well in terms of COVID and um, providing PPE. Um, I think that's very much appreciated uh, over this past number of weeks. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, my first one is in respect of the immediate short term. Um, I think we're all very concerned that the, the fact there, there are potentially going to be hundreds of students who are going to be unable to uh, com complete the semester uh, this year. That's very concerning. Uh, for me, I have a particular concern around the fact that um, e even during the peak of, of the COVID-19 crisis, um, uh, only 75% of students were accessing remote learning uh, during lockdown. Um, the makeup of that 25% uh, would concern me. So effectively, at best, one in four uh, weren't online. Uh, that's at the peak. We, we don't know what would be uh, continuously throughout that period. Um, I, I would have con concern around uh, the most disadvantaged students um, and the impact not only in terms of their access to learning, but in terms of their mental health as well. Uh, so I just want to get some clarity around um, the, the, the requirement for funding. Uh, do we know, you know what the shortfall is? What, what is the requirement there? Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is around uh, the relationship with employers uh, and apprentices. Um, Michael touched on the curriculum hubs, uh, which I think absolutely we want to see those uh, built and consolidated. But in terms of those employers' voices, have you heard from those employers over this past number of weeks? And how is that um, you know, differentiating from uh, what you would have heard prior to COVID-19? What are they asking for from you now uh, that, that we uh, as a, uh, an assembly could help with? 
Okay. Michael, do you want to pick that up and I'll come in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a number of questions on there. Thank you very much, Paul. And again, thank you for your support. Um, look, absolutely, we have been hearing from, from employers and in every industry. Certainly, we, we do tend to hear from the larger employers because they have... Uh, they have bodies on the ground and they have people there to engage with. A lot of the smaller employers do tend to, uh, in this type of scenario, uh, I suppose, fade into the background and, and it's hard to keep that engagement going with them, uh, uh, notwithstanding the fact that we, we uh, try very hard to do that. Um, so look, there is there is significant interest from, from the employers to get back up and running. I, I have no doubt that every industry w wishes they were back where they were before, before the lockdown because things were on a very, very good trajectory and, and the economy was going well and uh, you know we actually were struggling to meet the demand for apprentices r rather than having the situation we're in now with with uh, apprentices being furloughed and uh, some concern about you know recruits but I, I think I, I think it will be variable across Northern Ireland you know there will be pockets where it will be very quiet there will be pockets where uh, you know there are some early engagers and, and, and things will come out of lockdown much quicker. Uh, we have to be very mindful of the fact that some industries have now been given, you know, the go-ahead to go back to full operation, and others are are, are maybe still uh, being held uh, in reserve to some degree. And we have to mirror that in terms of the support that we give. So, you know, absolutely, we're very focused on on getting those students back. In terms of the cost, um, I suppose the big one for us initially will be around. Uh, all of the measures that we have to put in place to keep our staff and students safe and, and, and that will be a tremendous challenge but there's also the investment that's needed in the IT infrastructure and we know that the department has submitted a significant bid in the monitoring rounds to try and support that and you know we would hope that that that, that, that finds its way to fruition because uh, as you say quite rightly there are in these scenarios, it's usually the students who are socially disadvantaged, who are, are furthest from the resources and who struggle uh, to get access. We need to go the extra mile and support them. And if we have that funding coming from the centre through, uh, you know, through those bids, then you know we can make a significant contribution. Uh, a, a lot of the uh, students that, that are coming from the more, uh, well, the less disadvantaged quintiles. Quite often, they will have access to resources, you know, through the family home, etc., and, and they will be supported regardless of what. So it's those very disadvantaged young people that we need to be focused on. We can't put a figure on at this stage. Uh, we know what the figure is for IT that's been submitted, but in terms of the other costs, we still have to work through that uh, granularity and make sure that we get the right figures. But that will come very shortly through the oversight and advisory group. Uh, and, and, and Gary, to follow that, there, as, as well as the, I suppose, the digital advice, there's a motivational piece as well, given some of the breadth of learners that, that come into further education that benefit greatly from classroom contact and support from teachers and tutors. So because of, of some of uh, the young people that come into our sector that do have particular challenges, I mean, the benefits of the work we do with them is face-to-face. -face. I mean, to give you an example, if I take a piece of work we do with the prison service in, in HMP McGilligan, we had to revert to putting to sending workbooks into the prison initially to keep the momentum going where possible in the learning. So what you would have found is programs may be started, but level two learners might have begun to drop off because maybe the first couple of weeks they were able to keep in contact digitally, but then they were really missing the contact of a face-to-face -face class, the tutorial support. I mean, programs such as Princess Trust, which we operate as a college, work effectively in an environment where the tutor is working with the learners dealing with their particular challenges so it's just part of the broad fabric it, it just wouldn't all be sorted i believe by a digital divide piece we do have a bit about where certainly our delivery method has always benefited from really high quality teaching and support face to face with students may, may i just chip in there just to take another another part of where of gary's um questions which is really I think going to the heart of how do we respond to employers and how do we stay close to them to reflect the uh, as, as, as employer, employers go through and are um, retracting or retrenching and then building their capacity to go forward and uh, what I would say is that even in se sectors such as IT where we can see that they're reducing some of their recruitment we're we're working with them to look at how we can build capacity for the future so I think it is very important to, to reflect the, the sort of the, the lockstep approach 
that colleges have with the employers uh, with whom they're uh, engaging. And, and we are involved with a very wide range of industry groups. So, so we're working closely with each sector to understand the current and the, the, the future needs. And I think that, that it's, a, it's a, the other side of the coin in a way. You're, you're, you're focusing both on the needs of, of learners, particularly those uh, who, who, are, who might be deemed to be um, more, um, more marginalised or potentially suffering from the digital divide, but also how are we actively working with employers to make sure that we bridge those links and, and keep the focus on capacity building for the future mm. as the economy recovers. Thank and you. Some of, it, some of it, Gary, conclusion is sub-regional. I know in our own sub-region, the work we've been doing with the London Dairy Chamber or with the Causeway Chamber is crucial to get to get a voice in, in the business needs. So some of the stuff can be sorted at a Northern Ireland level, some of it is, is sub-regional just due to the industrial architecture within particular sub-regions. Thanks, Chair. And just very briefly, no, no, and I appreciate appreciate all those comments. Uh, you know, I personally will always be a champion of the college's uh, past student myself, and not that you'll be trumpeting that too loudly. Uh, but I do, I do really value the work uh, that, that that you do, especially uh, the staff. Um, as you now reopen or plan to reopen with your social distancing measures, uh, just very, very briefly. In terms of, uh, I'm assuming you're not going to take full capacity and that an element of remote learning will continue, but for those students who we, we're talking about, those maybe those disadvantaged, those who don't have the access, will they be given um, priority, if you like, in terms of access to the physical building, or how, would you, how will you work that out? Yeah, well, I, I suppose looking at, in response to that, absolutely. I, I mean, we're going to have to think of those students in the first place. Uh, there, there will almost certainly be a, a blended approach. So there will be face-to-face, -face, but there will also be uh, remote learning. What the percentages are, uh, who knows? I don't think we will uh, necessarily have to get up to the levels that we've had during the lockdown, uh, you know, which was uh, going 100% remote. But, I mean, who's to say? So we've got to go through all of the... Uh, processes again coming back to the oversight advisory group we've got to have those conversations and see what's possible and a lot of this will be impacted and driven by how many students in the current year we can get over the line and achieve qualifications if we can uh, have a good outcome there in partnership with uh, the warden organizations and if we can rely on the support of the regulator to make sure that they drive that forward uh, then you know, we're starting effectively with a clean slate, but there are a lot of variables at the moment, and it's hard to know, but you're absolutely right. We will be 100% behind targeting and supporting the most disadvantaged in that initial run out to make sure that if we're going to bring any students in uh, to campuses and, and give them that, that, that controlled access, uh, it will ha absolutely have to be those cohorts. And, and, and I think just to very briefly add, through the indulgence of the chair, I mean, we we are we as colleges are looking at Gary concept of phased return, do you, uh, rotated classes, looking at the sort of range of solutions to ensure that learners have access to kit either in college or, or, at home. So um, you know, those who are most vulnerable will be in the college socially distant more of the time and also younger learners would be in more of the time. So that's the whole bit about the FE sector being really responsive to that diverse group of learners that we have and really reflecting those who need face-to-face -face contact the most. And I think that that will be front and centre for all principals um, working with their teams and, and reflecting that um, ahead. Thank you. John? Uh, thank you, and uh, again, thanks to those who have given the presentation this morning. Uh, it's been very uh, useful. Uh, there, was, there was three elements of your presentation that jumped out at me. Uh, we won't be able to go into them in detail today, but it's, it's something I wish to return to uh, at future sessions. <laughs> Skills for the work market, competing for learners, and awarding organisations. Um, uh, just a, a, a comment, and then I'll come to my question. Even when I was Education Minister, I, I could never understand the benefits to our uh, education system of, of a market economy in relation to our qualifications. Uh, and I know they refer to uh, as the English exams bodies, which in language here you have to be very careful about because people will think you're picking on them because they're the English exams bodies. I, I don't care where they're from. Um, I, I think a, a market within our qualification system doesn't meet our needs. And when you look at what the Scottish system does, I, I think it's much more beneficial. Uh, and 
more responsive to the needs of, of a society, and I think want to be much more responsive uh, in the current climate. Uh, because I do think uh, he's referred to, you don't want to name and shame those bodies that perhaps aren't responding as well as you would want to at this current time. Uh, at a future session, if they're still, I may push you some that because we are a scrutiny committee uh, and we do require evidence and we do require information to be able to do our job and, and support the people uh, who we represent. So, but I'm not going to push you on that today. I want to come to my main question, which sort of intertwines with the skills for the work market. <coughs> uh, COVID-19 is happening, and Brexit is also happening, and both of those are having a major impact on our economy. And when I look at Brexit, particularly in terms of the workforce, we won't have as many uh, skilled workers coming from the EU. And when I'm talking about skilled workers, I'm talking about those workers who work in the construction industry, those workers who work in the engineering sector in, in around Mid Ulster, and even in, in my own constituency as well. So are, are the colleges <coughs> adopting to or promoting those trades that as a society, for want of a better term, we're beginning to turn our back on. These are well-paid, skilled jobs, uh, which if young people uh, go into, um, particularly, as, as I've said, with the impact of Brexit on the workforce, uh, there will be jobs created there. So are, are, the, more, are the colleges adopting to those new trends in the employment market? Uh, if I could come in there, uh, John, and try to respond to that. Absolutely. Look, I, I mean, I agree with everything that you've said. Uh, in terms of, you mentioned Mid Ulster, um, at, at our Dungannon campus, for example, I think we have something like 700 students who do not have a UK or a Republic of Ireland uh, nationality. So th that indicates to me that their families are in the region. They are working for the engineering industry, they're working in food processing and they're coming to colleges. So that, that, that means that we have a very significant body of young people and their parents who are contributing to the local economy. If that becomes a challenge going forward, you're absolutely right. We need to make sure that we continue to have more young people coming from our post-primary sector into colleges for these very um, challenging but exciting careers. And so, so there are lots of opportunities, and I think it would be fair to say that all of the colleges invest very heavily every year in terms of promotion. And, you know, we've been trying to do that in the lockdown, but, but that's, that's a common and that's an annual feature. We're out there, we're engaging with the schools. And my own college, for example, annually, we, we go out to 12 control schools, 14 maintained schools, three integrated, two special schools, and one EOTIS facility. So all of the colleges are replicating that. We're out there, we're pushing the message. And, and, and there is this, uh, I, I suppose, there's this constant challenge of us trying to make sure that we present the opportunities and we attract those young people into those careers and into those courses. Absolutely. I, I, would, I would say to add to that, John, uh, there is a, almost a, a need for a bit of a societal shift around the importance of, of many of those professional and technical opportunities uh, and we need so more people and we're doing a piece of work I think an awful lot with parents guardians people are associated in, in that decision making process as well to say actually there is a I mean in our own particular um, area uh, we have a, a regional skills group looking at this and there are gaps and vacancies in sectors such as hospitality which are pretty well salaried for people that qualify as chefs there are other sectors that are vacancies so the matching of that is a real uh, skills challenge. And as I said, not being a fan of a third of our young people heading away across the water, um, maybe perhaps that will be something in the future, be able to direct more of these young people uh, into career opportunities and keep them locally. But yes, there's a, uh, there's a societal challenge to change some mindset still about the importance of please. technical pathways. May, may, I, may I come in there, please, uh, Chair? I, I think in response to, to your question, John, the bottom line is we have to ensure that vocational pathways are absolutely held in the same esteem as other pathways to employment. And specifically, what I would like to say is that um, we use our research to understand what the trends and our work with industry, that, that informs what we deliver. And colleges every year will review their curriculum to adapt to whatever the job market needs and, and you've heard of the curriculum hubs there their work makes sure that the six colleges 
are consistent in the approach and understand what what, what industry um, needs. I think as we as we come back, uh, um, I know uh, perhaps I'm reflecting what's happened in my own home with a, a returning undergraduate first year who's now decided he's not going back across the water to England to go to university. He wants to come to an FE college because actually the focus on work and on employability is front and centre for him. And I think well, those conversations will be going on in many homes across um, Northern Ireland. So it is very important for us that colleges are seen as an option of, of first choice. And, and you talked uh, briefly, I think, that in a way, the whole strategy and the policy environment, I referred to that loosely earlier on, the whole strategy around 14 and 14 to 19 will be so important ahead in, in helping um, put that on the map in a very clear way. And I think that that will, um, back to my issue about uh, esteem uh, for vocational pathways, I think that that's going to be essential for our, our economy and for our society going forward. Thank you, Chair. No, thank you very much. Uh, and Louise, you, you've just finished off on what, what I was going to raise as my final point with you, which is around the 14 to 19 strategy. Um, we're aware that that has been paused and, and at, at the moment in uh, light of COVID, but obviously it's something that we really um, want to see progress. Um, and very much see that parity of esteem between um, vocational and academic learning um, highlighted within that strategy. So that's something we will pick up directly with the department as well. Um, that was really, really useful to all of us in terms of highlighting the issues that um, you're facing both in the immediate term and also the longer term. And as, as John highlighted, we will want to re return to that in more detail um, in, in the coming weeks. So look, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much indeed, um, Chair and Committee members. Um, and we look forward to you inviting us back. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair and Committee members. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Um, so obviously there's a lot of issues highlighted there, um, and I think that the committee will want to write to the minister on that. Also, Peter, I'm not sure if we know the membership of the oversight and advisory group. I had no information on the chair. I just picked up there from from what the principals were saying. Brian Doran from uh, Southern College is on it. Yeah, um, but I don't know who else is. Not, I, I don't think we've seen a terms of reference. I don't think we have. I know that um, student unions are represented on it, and I think that that's a mixed voice. Um, I think that learners really need to be represented as well, and I'm not sure if the trade unions are represented, but obviously that would be important. Sure, so well, if it's helpful, ask, um, I can I suggest that uh, a letter to the minister might be useful just to raise all the issues that have been followed or been raised today. Plus those raised in the correspondence that is in the pack as well from um, Mike McAllister, the, who's currently chairing the college principals group. Um, I think there's a lot of really timely stuff, yeah. including the issue around the, the 14 to 19 strategy mm. being paused. Yet, yeah, I think in every letter we've sent to the minister, there, there's been uh, an issue raised around um, skills being so important to the recovery, to bringing the, the the economy out of this situation um, and maybe the timing yeah. should be considered if members are content to write to minister on, on, on that basis. Yeah, the, the 14 to 19 strategy dates back to my time in the department and before my time in the department. It's like trying to get the secrets of Fatima yeah. revealed as trying to get that strategy through. And, and I think some of it is uh, departments being territorial um, and that needs to be broken down. Chair, members will recall we were going to have a joint session with the Education Committee. I know they've been really, really keen um, to move this forward as well. Would it be helpful um, if, if members were content to write to the Education Committee as well, reflecting all that this committee has heard from many briefings, suggesting that skills and a strategic approach to skills is, yeah. is the best way to recover and rebuild? Yeah, and a skills strategy was one of the strategies in NDNA. Yeah. So um, it maybe would be timely to ask about progress, if any, in yeah. respect of that. Okay. If members are content, then we we'll proceed with that. Great. Right, yeah. Okay. Um, well, members, I think that that basically concludes our meeting today. Unless members have any other business that they want to raise. I understand there's an ad hoc on Thursday. Yeah. I, I under. And it was it will involve, I suppose, the reopening of businesses and the 
the speeding up of the process. So I think that's to be welcomed. And uh, I don't know whether we want to put any thought or whatever into for any ad hoc, what lines of question or Chair, if, if it's helpful I can gather together a lot of the issues that there have mm -hmm. been in terms of reopening how it'll happen and so on. And tomorrow we have tomorrow we, we have yeah, um, and I and um, Belfast Chamber. Yes, as well as CEF. Um, so it'll give a good opportunity to hear those issues again from them. Things have moved on. Um, members will have seen on TV yesterday that some stores were they were able to follow public health guidance and have a street entrance rather than having to go through other premises. Have reopened. The, the, the big one obviously was the, the Debenhams one that the yeah. Minister attended. Um, so they'll be able to give us feedback on how that's actually working in practice. Um, and I know from the correspondence that we had, there are concerns around how it's all going to be managed yeah. in terms of queuing yeah. and things like that that we will want to go Yes, that's again. right. I understand, yeah. Chair, as well, the councils have now further responsibilities. Recently, uh, the, the legislation has been amended last week, I believe, and therefore they have more responsibility on advising on how to manage and enforcement in relation to businesses and including retail. So I think that's to be welcomed and I think you know any clarification we can get on that okay. because it's going to be an ongoing issue for all of us as uh, mm. businesses open up and you, you know you made the point about managing people outside the, the, mm. on the shop who is responsible, who's not responsible and at the end of the day someone needs to you know at least give advice on it to business owners and to, to the public, so any information we can get I think would be useful. Chair, it was one of the issues flagged up by Nilga and Solis. Um, their expectation was they would be the ones leading on management of queuing and so on in town centre, city centres within their um, council boundaries. And while they were prepared to, to go ahead, take lead on that, and, and were looking at plans, they did talk about resource. Um, required for managing that. I know um, mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, um, an example being um, amenity sites and recycling sites, uh, councils have employed um, the likes of event sex staff mm -hmm. just to make sure that there's a greater level of management. And, and again, that might be something that, that needs to be thought about with reopening of village, town, city centres, and that's going to require resource. Um, so it might be worth clarifying that as well, see if the, if the Minister um, is making any plans there, okay. especially if, if councils have been given this increased enforcement role as well. Okay, fair Lots to gather up. Okay. And Great, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Okay, well then, the date, time and place of our next meeting is tomorrow morning mm -hmm. in room 30 here. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.